Welcome back to Patrick Boyle on Finance. As most of my regular viewers know, I've been a trader for over 20 years, and from the very start of my career, I've taken a quantitative approach to researching and executing trading strategies. A quant trader is just a trader who builds statistical models to test trading strategies rather than relying on intuition and experience. Quants try to take a scientific approach and work out what drives price changes in markets. This approach really appealed to me in my early years as a trader because I had no experience to rely on and I was able to look at what other people did and test all of the different approaches to see which rules worked and which ones didn't. Today the approach still appeals to me, both because I've become good at testing systems but also because I feel that removing emotion from trading tends to improve returns. When you look at the returns of different quant traders, you'll often notice that there's not an awful lot of overlap, and that's because different traders look for different types of trade that appeal to them. Different traders will have different risk management rules, trade different financial products, or just have differing opinions as to what the cutoff is for a good trading signal. Thus, as long as they're not trading a cookie cutter strategy, you wouldn't really expect them to be highly correlated. As traders and investors, we can learn a lot about how to approach a problem based on how people have tackled similar problems in the past. So let's take a look at the history of quantitative trading. You might expect me to begin this story in the 1960s, but we're going to go back a bit further than that in time, because quant trading involves collecting and analyzing price data. And the first historical examples of this being done are the thousands of clay tablets that archaeologists unearthed in central Turkey, dating back to around 2000 BC. Ancient Babylonian traders recorded the prices of agricultural crops, silver and gold on clay tablets, so that they could be analyzed and used to forecast future price moves. They stored these clay tablets in private archives, a massive fire destroyed the building where they were stored, which baked and preserved the clay tablets, leaving a record of ancient price histories, with a level of detail which wouldn't be matched until the merchant houses of the Italian Renaissance began to document their trading activities. So as far back in history as we can go, we see traders trying to learn something from price data. We also learn the importance of backing up your data. Next up we have Thales, the ancient Greek mathematician, astronomer, and pre-Socratic philosopher, who achieved riches from an olive harvest by predicting the weather. According to Aristotle's account, Thales put down a deposit during the winter on all of the olive presses in Miletus, which would allow him exclusive use of the presses after the harvest. Because the harvest was in the future and nobody could be sure whether the harvest would be plentiful or not, he was able to secure the contracts for a very low price. From the olive press owner's point of view, they were protecting themselves against a poor harvest by earning at least some money up front regardless of how things turned out. Tala's bet paid off big time. There was a huge harvest and heavy demand for the olive presses. Thales held the monopoly and was able to rent them out at a huge profit. Either he was an expert forecaster or he had calculated that a bad harvest would not lose much money for him, whereas the upside of a good harvest might be enormous. Thus he showed the world that philosophers can easily be rich if they like, but that their ambition is of another sort, according to Aristotle. Of course, today we have the counterexample of George Soros, who wanted to become a philosopher but instead became rich. Sometimes things just don't work out for you. Our next historical example is Christopher Kurtz, a 16th century Antwerp trader who claimed to be able to forecast prices of commodities up to 20 days in advance using a technical trading system based on back-tested astrological signals. The link between quantitative analysis and astrology are a bit comical in this day and age, but at the time astrology was a way of life applied to a wide ranging areas of human endeavor, including warfare and medicine. Thales had also made his meteorological predictions based on the movements of the stars and planets. If Kurtz had just based his research on astrology, 
he would not really have made the list. But he also tried to backtest his signals, deducing certain credible principles along the way, such as the idea that prices of agricultural commodities often move in long persisting trends. To this day, most commodity trading advisors are classified as trend followers, and I'm sure a few of them are probably astrologers too. Our next example comes from the Dojima Rice Exchange in Japan. The Dojima Exchange was initially a marketplace where people came to trade physical rice. But in 1710, a system of using coupons which promised delivery of rice at a future point in time became popular. From this, a secondary market of coupon trading emerged. The Dojima Rice Exchange had become the first futures exchange. The biggest speculator at the time was Munehisa Hama. Other traders at the time referred to him as the god of markets. He developed the Japanese candlestick charting method, which plots open high-low close market prices over a given period of time, formulating his own version of technical analysis, which remains popular to this day. In my early days as a trader, I tested hundreds of candlestick patterns and didn't find many that were predictive, but collecting and organizing this data to search for patterns was a definite step in the right direction. We're told that Hama's ultimate principle was that when goods become extremely expensive, they then must become inexpensive again. So it would appear that he was a mean reversion trader rather than a trend follower. Stories from the time claim that Hama managed to establish a network of employees spaced every four miles along the road between Sakata and Osaka, a distance of just under 400 miles, to communicate market prices. This can be thought of as an early version of the fast data lines that high-frequency traders use today. For our next example, we move to London in the 1800s, where there was a roaring trade in detailed price charts that economists prepared and sold to financial speculators for analysis. Later in the United States, Charles Dow, who devised the Dow Jones Industrial Average and helped launch the Wall Street Journal, popularized modern technical analysis. While technical traders are often targets of derision today, some top traders like Stanley Druckenmiller and Paul Tudor Jones are known to rely on technical analysis to confirm their investing ideas. Give them a little drums along the mohawk. Professor Andrew Lowe of MIT argues that technical analysts were the forefathers of quantitative analysts. However, their methods were never subjected to independent and thorough testing, and most of their rules arose from a mysterious combination of human pattern recognition and reasonable sounding rules of thumb, raising questions about their efficacy. I made a video around a year ago on testing the trading adage, sell in May and go away, which I'll link to at the end of this video. So modern quantitative trading really appeared in the United States in the mid-1960s, when mathematicians and statisticians with access to computers and market data began analyzing markets. Edward Thorpe was probably the first modern mathematician to use quantitative strategies to invest sizable sums of money, beginning in 1964. Thorpe was an academic who had worked with Claude Shannon, the father of information theory. After reading books on technical analysis, as well as security analysis by Graham and Dodd, Thorpe writes in his autobiography that he was surprised and encouraged by how little was known by so many. Another professor around the same time at Berkeley, named Victor Niederhofer, began writing a number of papers on anomalies in stock market behavior. His 1966 paper, Market Making and Reversal on the Stock Exchange, is considered the first paper on statistical arbitrage and market microstructure. Niederhofer used innovative methods to search for opportunities in stock markets, such as his paper, The Analysis of World Events and Stock Prices, which used the font size of newsprint to determine the relative importance of news events and measure how they affected the stock market. He left academia in 1972 to launch a quantitative hedge fund. These quant trading pioneers had strong backgrounds in statistics, along with access to computers and price data. They got their start around the same time 
that the efficient market hypothesis was becoming popular. But instead of accepting it as gospel, they did their own analysis. I'd strongly recommend reading both of their autobiographies, which not only demonstrate their way of thinking, but they're also really entertaining reads. Through the 1970s, these quant trading pioneers were amongst the top returning traders, but they still went largely unnoticed by Wall Street. They made outsized returns at a time when there were very few quant traders. Throughout the 1980s, mathematicians and physicists were recruited to work on Wall Street and in the city of London, but they were mostly tasked with building derivatives pricing models. They were nicknamed rocket scientists by the traders who at the time thought rocketry was the most advanced branch of science. Immanuel Derman, who wrote the excellent autobiography My Life as a Quant, describes arriving at Goldman Sachs in 1985 and instantly noticing the shame associated with being numerate, how things have changed. In the early 1980s, a London-based sugar broker charged his son Michael Adam with updating the commodities charts for the firm. Michael automated the process using computers and then began searching for trading indicators. He hired in an Oxford classmate and computer programmer Martin Lewick to assist. They then recruited Cambridge graduate David Harding to the team. Michael's father fired the team after a while. Well, he fired two of them and kept on his son, viewing their work as time-wasting. They went out on their own and launched a fund named AHL for the first letter in each of their last names. They built quantitative models that traded trends in commodities, going on to be amongst the most profitable traders at the time. After being bought out by Mann Group, the three split up. Harding went on to launch Winton Capital and Lewick launched Aspect Capital. Michael Adam changed his name to Mike Marlin and became a musician. Today, AHL, Winton and Aspect are amongst the largest quant funds in the world, and you can find Mike Marlin's music on Spotify. I've listened to it and he's considerably better than DJ Diesel, the underground musician who in his spare time is the CEO of Goldman Sachs. In the mid-1980s, the investment banks dipped their toes into the world of quant trading. Morgan Stanley's Automated Proprietary Trading Group was started in 1985 by Jerry Bamberger, a computer scientist who noticed that traders executing big blocks of shares were temporarily moving the market. He built a database tracking the prices of various paired stocks, stocks like Home Depot and Lowe's or Coke and Pepsi, that might be expected to move somewhat in line with each other. If a big block trade moved one of the stocks but not the other, he could make money betting on these price spreads returning to their historic price levels after the block trade was done. The APT group at Morgan Stanley started the careers of people like David Shaw of D.E. Shaw fame and Robert Fry who went on to develop the pairs trading approach at Renaissance Technologies. Morgan Stanley shut down the group in the late 1980s after only a few years unhappy with how highly paid the traders were and nervous about the risk. They squandered some of the most lucrative trading strategies in the history of finance by doing this. In 1988, codebreaker and mathematician James Simons launched Medallion Fund, which went on to be the highest returning hedge fund in history. I'll put a link in the description below to my video on James Simons and to the excellent biography by Gregory Zuckerman that I based the video on. The same year David Shaw launched D.E. Shaw. The world has changed significantly over the last 20 or so years. Quants are no longer a rarity in the world of finance. Many tasks that used to be done manually or over the phone are now done electronically. Today a cell phone has significantly more processing power than the computers that the pioneers of quantitative trading used in the 1960s. In addition, data is much easier to come by today. Forbes magazine estimates that 90% of the data in the world today was generated in the last two years. It's a lot easier to do quantitative research today, but equally there's a lot more competition. A lot of people think that quants are human computers, 
But hopefully some of these examples show you the importance of idea generation and creativity. If you want to discover good trading signals, the only thing limiting you in this day and age is your own creativity. Today, just like throughout history, a quant trader needs to come up with smart and interesting ideas that they can test using data. They need to be driven by curiosity to learn new things, and they need to persevere and keep finding new trades that work, as over time every new idea becomes old, outdated, and often stops working. If you found this interesting, you'll probably enjoy the video I made on James Simons, and you should also check out some of the book suggestions in the description below. If you watched the whole video and didn't like it, make sure to hit the dislike button and the unsubscribe button. How else will I learn? See you guys later. Bye.